พระคว่าพุทธังพระคาวันตังอภิวาเทนสวัสดิ์พระคาวตาธรรมโมธรรมังนามาสามสุปฏิปันโนภะคะวะโตสาวกสังโฆสังขังนามานโมตัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมตัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมตัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะอิติปิโสภะคะวะอะระหังสัมมาสัมพุทโธเวชาจารณะสัมปันโนสุขะโตโลกาวิทูอานุตโรปุริสัทธรรมสารติสันทเทวมนุษย์สานังพุทธวันติสวัสดิตัวพระคาวตาธรรมโมสันเทเทโกอาภาริโกเอหิปัสสิโกโอปานายโกปัญจันตังเวทิตามโพวินยุหินติสุปฏิปันโนภะคะวะโตสาวกสังโฆโอโชปฏิปันโนภะคะวะโตสาวกสังโฆยายาปฏิปันโนภะคะวะโตสาวกสังโฆสามิจิปฏิปันโนภะคะวะโตสาวกสังโฆยาทิทางจัตตาริปุริสายุคานิอันตาปุริสปุคะลาเอสะภะคะวะโตสาวกะสังโฆมาหุนายโยมปาหุนายโยมทักขีนายโยอังชาลีกาลนิโยอานุตตารังปุญญาเขตังโลกาสันติสวัสดีค่ะทุกท่านขอเวลาสักสิบนาทีที่จะทำการปฏิบัติธรรมในขณะที่เราจะเริ่มการปฏิบัติธรรมในวันนี้อาจารย์ยุตตะธรรมโมโอเวลคัมทูแชร์นอเลจและเอ็กซ์เพียรินส์ในเรื่องมิดิเทชันส์และมาร์ฟูเนสส์ดังนั้นทุกคนขอให้พวกเราพร้อมกับร่างกายและจิตใจของเราเพื่อรับรู้และเรียนรู้จากอาจารย์ในหนึ่งนาที Please mute your microphone as well. Thank you.
I am orders. All right, Anumodhana to everyone. And good morning once again, brother and sister, BA student, MA student, and PhD student. Uh, may I pay respect to Thanajan Yutta Thammo uh, Piku, who will come to share knowledge and experience about mindfulness and meditation for today. We are so delighted that Tanajan can accept and join our class IBSC student on behalf of uh, IBSC. So thank you so much for your coming today. So first of all, before we are going to move to 
our topic that is Q&A on uh, mindfulness practice. So I would like to introduce Tanajan Venerable Yutta Thammo uh, briefly. So for Tanajan Venerable Yutta Thammo, uh, he is a Canadian-born Theravada Buddhist monk. He ordained as a monk in uh, 2001 under the guidance of uh, most venerable Tanajan Thong Sri Mangkalo of Chiang Mai, Thailand. And he has practiced uh, intensive and daily meditation following the Mahasi Sayadaw tradition since January uh, 2000. He keeps discipline in line with the Theravada Buddhist monastic code, including not touching money, owning uh, only one set of robes. And he has taught uh, intensive meditation in Thailand, Sri Lanka, USA, and Canada since uh, 2003, and give online teachings via a YouTube, both live and pre-recorded. He gives the Dhamma talk in both English and Thai to both intensive meditator. Uh, and by invitation to general public, he facilitated an online meditation site, uh, meditation.sirimangkalo.org with group meditation and individual video-based meditation courses and answer question in a regular live broadcast via YouTube and audio streaming. He studied Sanskrit, Bali and Indian religions at McMaster University and University of Toronto, formal Thai Dhamma, Abhidhamma and Bali study at Wat Pathasi Jom Thong, Chiang Mai as well. And also he teach Bali classes to advanced meditators from time to time. So, now he is the president of Sri Mangkalo International, a non-profit organization that maintains the website srimangkalo.org and Facebook as well. Um, so now he is here already. So may I pay respect to Tanajan Sri Tanajan Yuta Thammo. Okay. Um, Okay, Tanajan. So today, um, the topic is Q and A on uh, mindfulness practice. So, um, if anyone has questions about mindfulness practice, you so you can ask by I press right hand up, and uh, I will let you to uh, ask Tanajan Yuta Tamo. So please, everyone, if you have questions. So you can ask, okay. Limunchin. Well, thank you for inviting me. Maybe I can say a few words before. before okay, please wait for a moment. Okay. Okay, please, Pajan, Yuta Tamo. If someone has a question, go ahead. Does someone already have a question? Uh, not really, Ajahn. You please go ahead first. Kindly go ahead. No, I, I was just going to fill time. If you have a question already, go ahead. <laughs> not really, Ajahn. I was just thinking, um, lay people for us. Uh, we sometimes think that uh, we couldn't practice as good as the monks, the Sangha members, because uh, we are not renunciants. Or we, are, um, uh, we feel like there's something lacking in us, insufficient, incomplete, because we have not renounced and uh, we practice hard and uh, we feel there is some um, improvements, transformation in ourselves, in our mind, the development, uh, more calm, more focused, and the mind, the purity of the mind. We can sense that um, there's a lot of things that we used to feel and uh, affected by emotions now is lacking. But somehow we have this kind of a distracting mind in us that, oh, uh, maybe I could not go further because I have not renounced. Could you please kindly uh, uh, enlighten me on that on maybe for all my friends here? Thank you. 
Well, you, you may be aware that there are monks who are not very good at focusing their mind either and have distracted minds. The Buddhist ordination is a vehicle. So you have a different kind of vehicle. We all have our circumstance. Not all lay people have the same circumstance. Someone who ha is very rich will have a different circumstance from someone who is very rich. Someone who has a family will be in a different situation. You sure? Please, it suits. Uh, hi, Jan. I'm sorry, so sorry. So, could you please unmute microphone? I'm not sure what happened. Okay. Okay. So, could, could you speak up, Hi, Jan? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Am I too quiet? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know how to be louder. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's great. Speak into the microphone. Loud enough? Okay, thank you. Uh, so I don't know what you heard or didn't hear. I, I was saying how monks and lay people have different situations. Um, so a rich lay person is going to have a different situation from a poor lay person. Someone with family is going to have a different situation from someone without family. But the monastic uh, structure is a vehicle that allows, that gives you the opportunity to structure your life in a very pure and beneficial way if you choose to use it. Now, some people own very powerful vehicles, powerful cars and they just um, wipe them with a cloth. No, they don't actually drive them anywhere. Okay. Monastic life can be like that, just because you live uh, as a Buddhist monastic doesn't mean you're actually taking advantage of it. You're actually using the vehicle for what it was designed. So, but the question of whether a lay person can uh, compete, let's say, with a monk in terms of their mental development. All other things being equal, they can't compete. So for any given individual, ordination will absolutely improve their potential to practice. If a person, if a lay person is dedicated and committed and intent upon uh, cultivation and uh, development in the Buddha's teaching, becoming a monk will be better for them, will help them to do that, will allow them to practice on a level that they were not able to as a lay person. And that being said, for some people, it's not necessary. They, they, they don't need the vehicle. A lay person can become an arahant. There are many examples of this and more examples of lay people who became anagami and stayed as lay people. So if you are thinking about renouncing and, and ordaining, it's important that you see it for what it is. You understand that it's a vehicle for that purpose and you, you understand how it is a vehicle for that purpose, why it works. Understand the, the um, ethical precepts that you take on, understand the livelihood that you take on, research and study it and understand it. And uh, absolutely go for it. If it's something that you are in a position to undertake, 
And if you are inclined to use it for what it was meant for, uh, it, it will benefit you. But absolutely anyone will tell you it's not necessary. It's just a nicer, uh, more comfortable, faster vehicle. I mean, it's quite uncomfortable, of course, to be a monk if you're following the precepts, but it's comfortable for your practice, for, for your cultivation of wholesome uh, mind states. If you are intent upon that, it gives you a very good opportunity because you don't have to worry about food. Uh, you don't have to worry about clothing or, or shelter. In a, if you are in a monastic situation that allows you to live the monastic life as it was presented or, or constructed by the Buddha, um, it, it, it provides an incredible uh, opportunity to, to cultivate your mind without having to worry about so many of the things that lay people have to be uh, engaged in. Your duties become very few. You don't have duties to society in the same way. Um, your, your needs are reduced. Your desires are cut off. If you stop using money, if you stop... Uh, uh, keeping food and cooking food, if you stop wearing anything but a simple robe, uh, and if you keep the, the general livelihood of a monastic, you, you don't have the opportunity to engage in, in all the sensuality that ordinary people do. I think the, the basic answer is that, uh, yes, becoming a monastic is to your benefit. It will, it will always be to your benefit uh, if, you, if you make use of it. Okay, thank you so much for your answer. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, question, Sister Lee Moon Chin. Uh, Advin, right? Advin Mikinsan, you have a question, right? Could you turn on your microphone and ask Tanajan? Okay, Edwin, can you hear me? Okay, you can. No, okay. Uh, okay, please. <laughs> okay. He can hear you now. Okay. Um, my question, can you hear me, Venerable? Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, my question is kind of technical and maybe a little silly, but it's um, about how to avoid infinite regress during mindfulness meditation. So at any given moment, you're, you are... Uh, kind of reflect on the previous moment and then you the next experience is that that reflection and so that would be the next experience to reflect on and so if you continue reflecting on the previous reflection then you get into a kind of infinite regress and that for me is kind of confusing so if you have any insight i would appreciate that mm -hmm. The mind doesn't really work that way. Um, there are um, the mind states, to get really technical, I see you even have the manual of Abhidhamma on your bookshelf. Um, the, the different minds, different vijnana have different uh, functions. And so the one that relates most directly to the practice of mindfulness has a different function than the one which experiences something. So when you 
uh, respond to an experience, to, to put it simply and, and simplistically in a way, when you respond to an experience with mindfulness, the next moment is not going to be responding to that responding. The next moment is going to be the result of the responding with mindfulness. And then you can take that as an object with mindfulness again. So it, it, it deals with how, how, how the mind is more complicated than just one mind and another mind knows it, another mind knows it, another mind knows it. And, and uh, as I understand your question, the idea that you're getting at, the mind just doesn't work that way. Uh, there's going to be a result of being mindful and it would be that result, which is a vipaka. And, and it's much more complicated than that, of course. It's, it's actually quite simplistic. But on a practical level, we don't engage with the mind on the level of the Abhidhamma. It's too quick. It's too complex. So simplistically and, and practically, we, we get a sense of the result of being mindful or the result of any number of other things that are going to come in and, and interrupt, and we be mindful of that. But you don't take the mindfulness as an object. The mindfulness is a intentional mind, and, and it's, it's an engaging mind. It, it, you just have to learn about the, the mental process, and you can get a sense of, at, at least a vague sense of, of um, what's really happening. Okay, thank you so much for your questions, uh, Advin. So, anyone has questions so you can ask Anachan. So I think it's very, okay, please. Anachan, go to Mina. Yeah, please. Yeah, can I ask? Vantami, oh. uh, Anachan. Very good morning, Anachan. Anachan, I have one doubt. I'm a Vipassana practitioner. So what is the difference between general medication and Vipassana medication? Sorry, what was the name of the first one? Uh, Achan, my name is uh, Gautama Mena. No, no, what, what was the, the first, you said the difference between two things. What were the first, what was the first yeah. thing? The first thing is, what is the difference between the giant, uh, common meditation and Vipassana meditation? I, I don't understand the first thing that you're comparing. I understand vipassana meditation. What's the other type of meditation? Commonly used to many people in a meditation, 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 right? The chant. Commonly? They used meditation. Okay. So what is the difference between meditation and vipassana meditation? Uh, so meditation and vipassana meditation. Yes, it's a chant. Well, vipassana meditation is meditation. Okay, so that is uh, the only teaching from Buddha, right, Acha? That is the teaching of Buddha, right, Acha? Vipassana is the teaching of the Buddha. The Buddha would talk so many in so many different ways about seeing clearly. The word vipassana means seeing clearly. Okay. That's probably the best translation I can give of it, and. So that's yeah, very much what he taught. There are other types of meditation that are not vipassana. Uh, so we are the lay people. We, we are so much of confusion. Many people are okay. That's why. All right. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about what makes vipassana meditation vipassana meditation. I practice a particular technique of meditation. And I, I often joke, I've heard people say about my meditation, that if you practice my meditation way, it's vipassana. If you practice it any other way, it's, it's samatha. I've heard other people say, if you practice it the way I practice it, it's samatha. And, any other, and some other way is vipassana. So it gets quite confusing. People think of a technique. We, we commonly look at, at meditations based on the technique. And that's not the best way to categorize meditation practices. 
it's one way. Um, but it's not what makes a practice samatha or vipassana. And so I would say there are, I'm probably too loud now, right? I would say there are, well, let's say three categories we can put meditation in. Uh, the first one is vipassana, the second one is samatha, and the third is what we would say is not meditation. People call what they're doing meditation, and we would say that's not really meditation. And so let's talk about that one first. That's something like if a person sits down and closes their eyes and just sees what happens, right? They just let whatever's going to happen, happen. Even they might, let's say they listen to some calming music or, or nature sounds or something. That's not meditation. It's not meditation if you're not doing anything, if you're not doing some work, if you're not training your mind, if you're just letting it go, just relaxing, that's not meditation. Yoga is not in and of itself meditation because it's training the body. So unless during the yoga, you're training your mind in a specific way, that's not meditation. Sitting still is not meditation. Walking back and forth is not meditation. You have to be training the mind in some way for it to be meditation. So in what we would call meditation, I guess, let's say there's even another category that's not meditation, is where you train your mind. It is meditation, but it's bad meditation, where you train your mind in a bad way. In English, we have a phrase, premeditated murder. And it's kind of apt because you think about it. You you cultivate the will to murder someone. If you sit around and you plot it out and you you convince yourself, you work yourself, uh, you encourage yourself to do it, you develop the mind state of desire to kill. That's a kind of a meditation because you're training your mind. Soldiers have to train their minds as well as their bodies. They have to train themselves to be able to kill. If you train yourself in greed, in anger, in delusion, if your training involves that, that we would say is bad meditation. But any other kind of meditation, we can say, falls into two categories. And it's not based on the technique that you use to train your mind. It's based on the object. The object that your, your meditation is focused on. And here's the definition that I will give. You can... Uh, judge for yourself whether it's right. Any meditation that takes ultimate reality as an object is vipassana meditation. Any meditation that does not take ultimate reality as its object is samatha meditation. So it takes a, conceptual, a conceptual object. So what does it mean, ultimate reality and conceptual uh, object? Ultimate reality, to put it simply, without talking too much about Abhidhamma, is your experience. Experience is quite simple. There's not much diversity. There's seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and thinking. These six are our experience. And they're real. We know they're real because we experience them. But the objects that we see and hear and, and, and so on and think about, the things, the entities, are concepts. So if you hear a dog barking, hearing is an experience. That's real. But the dog, you're not experiencing the dog. Dog is something that arises in, in your mind, in your heart. You, you, you get a, maybe a picture of a dog in your mind or a concept, an idea of a dog. And that's a concept. So meditation that focuses on the concept, the dog, is samatha meditation. Meditation that focuses on the hearing, the experience that arises and ceases at the ear, is vipassana meditation. Why is that? Because focusing on the dog will, it's very simple. The simple reason is 
focusing on the dog, focusing on any concept, will not allow you to see the three characteristics. And vipassana, seeing clearly, means seeing the three characteristics, seeing the nature of reality as anicca, dukkha, and anatta. You cannot see that in concepts. The concept of a dog is permanent, is stable. It's like the concept of the Buddha, if you think of the Buddha when you meditate. The Buddha is still the Buddha after 2,500 years. He hasn't changed. He hasn't become something else. He hasn't ceased. But your thoughts of him, those thoughts arise and cease. So if you focus on the thinking about the Buddha, if you focus on the thought, that's real. If you focus on the Buddha, it's not real. It's a concept. It's stable, satisfying, and it's controllable. These kind of meditations are the ones that allow you to uh, control your mind, to enter into high states of concentration, cultivate magical powers, remember your past lives, read people's minds, see things far away, hear things far away, and so on. That's samatha meditation. Vipassana meditation, focusing on the experience, is focusing on things that arise and cease, things that come and go quite quickly. And so it's not pleasant. It's not stable. It's not controllable. And it has nothing, and there's no self. So non-self, not only not controllable, but these things are not entities. They're not concrete. They don't have a, a, a self to them. Like this, this, you, know, you can see this, what is this? This is a fist, right? Is this fist real? You see the fist? Watch. Look at this fist, right? This is a thing. It's an entity. Now, when I go like this, where did the fist go? The fist wasn't real. It isn't real. It doesn't exist. There's seeing and there's conceiving. But the seeing arises and ceases and doesn't have a, it doesn't have a self doesn't have entities so by focusing in that way you're cultivating vipassana that's what makes something vipassana so the meditation tradition that i follow is making use of a mantra and that's the technique it's often called noting practice but i think that's missing the point because it's exactly the same meditation as saying to yourself buddho buddho or which you might not be familiar of things like patavi patavi some of you might know that patavi means earth and it's the example given in the visuddhimagga of a samatha meditation focusing on the concept of earth earth as a concept thinking of earth the earth earthiness you take a disc of clay and you put it in front of you and you say patavi patavi or something like that in thai they would say din 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 in english you would say earth 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 if you want and you come to be able to conceptualize earth as your experience but the point is they use a mantra there's a use of a mantra a word or a phrase that you repeat to yourself that focuses your attention our, my tradition uses that as well, and using the mantra does not make it samatha. And this is why I said many, some I have heard people say, "You're using a mantra that must be samatha," and that's not. That's impossible to be correct. It has nothing to do with the 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 use of a mantra or whatever. It has to do with the object. If the object that the mantra is pointing to is a concept, the concept. then yes, it's samatha meditation. But instead of focusing on the Buddha or earth, if you focus on seeing or hearing and you say to yourself, hearing, hearing, then you're focused on the reality and you're able to experience it clearly arising and ceasing. But it focuses your attention nonetheless. So the difference there is just in the object. If I were to, if I heard a dog and I said to myself, dog 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 and i was imagining a dog then that would be summit meditation because the dog would be consistent
But if you say hearing, hearing, if you listen to my voice and say hearing, hearing, you come to see that, oh, it's not consistent. It's unpredictable. It's not very comfortable or pleasant to focus on it as an object because you can't predict when I'm going to start speaking and when I'm going to stop. It disturbs your peace and quiet that samatha gives you. So that's a, a basic rundown of the differences between samatha and vipassana. Okay, Venerable Kemamon, right? Okay, please unmute your microphones. Uh, yes, good. Good morning, Ajam. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your uh, allowing me to ask the question with, with Ajam. I would like to know from uh, Ajam meditation. In my question is, uh, sorry, I respect all of our friend also. Uh, my question is, in the modern day, in the modern society, some of the people they practice, they usually practice mindfulness meditation. Some of the people they are often. Not every day, often, they practice mindfulness meditation. Some other people, they are never practice mindfulness meditation. Those people, three of the, three of the people, how they are different to concentrate, concentrate their mind, to train their mind. How they are different. I would like to know from Ajahn, your boss, please. With example, Ajahn. Could you give me with example, please? Thank you so much, Ajahn. Okay. Uh, do you mean people who practice other types of meditation instead? I mean, uh, some other people, they practice meditation every day. Okay. Some other people, they often they practice not every day first yes, yes. some of the people never practice meditation with example Ajahn, how they are different mm. to concentration their mind well you you can't generalize because everyone is different right some people are drug addicts some people are murderers but the, the biggest difference is the delusion, the moha. Because even a person who is good, who practices kusala, can still have uh, avijja, they still have ignorance. So they can never be free from samsara. Even if they help people and do good deeds, they still may have ignorance. So it will be difficult to tell the difference because you look at them and you say, they're such a good person. They're kind, they're thoughtful, they're wise, wise in a worldly way. But they don't have the clarity of mind. They don't have the clear understanding of their momentary experiences. So... I'm hesitant to, to, to talk about a difference between someone who practices every day. Let's say someone who is mindful throughout their day. Uh, because at the moment when you're mindful, your experience is very different. You're not experiencing people. You're experiencing moments. you're going to be looking at the world quite differently. So you'll see things like the engagement on a personal level. If you see someone hurt, a person who is not mindful will become upset. They'll be worried about them. Now, if you see someone who is 
smiling and charming and beautiful, the person who is not mindful will become attracted to them, will engage with them. But even if they are free from attraction, aversion, they're still going to engage as people. They're going to be asking questions and talking about issues of people. They will engage in conversation about current events. And a person who is practicing mindfulness, if they are truly dedicated to it, they're going to be much more focused on their experiences. They're going to be answering questions based on experiences. Their mind is going to be much more pure, but it's also going to be much more experiential. So they will be talking about experiences. They won't be talking all that much either. But the difference is really in, in, in the outlook. The outlook um, uh, um, on a conceptual, conceptual level versus on an experiential level. So if you've practiced mindfulness meditation, you know the difference. The one way of looking at the world is you're looking at the seeing, the hearing, the feeling, and the, the thinking, and all the emotions, and so on. You're, you're, you're seeing that as it's happening. A person who is working on, an experience, on a conceptual level is focused on the things, the people, the concepts, the situations, issues, current events and so their their outlook is going to be much different they, they will become tired and and unhealthy as a result because they're not uh, the buddha the buddha said it's like if you cut grass that grass dries up it's like that when your mind is cut off from reality living in concepts even if you have good intentions the the dealing with abstractions is unhealthy and so you you feel tired you feel unhealthy you feel unwell it's why uh, people who try to do good in the world often become burnt out because they're not grounded in reality I don't know if that was the answer you're looking for, but Thank that, you so that would be. I got your point. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, next. Uh, you're Japan, right? You have any question? The next turn is Daniel. Okay. Please forgive me. My my hand touched okay. on the photo. How can I do? I can okay. do it. Okay, that's thank you. No, no, no problem. Okay, no problem. Uh, Daniel, please next, please. Uh, please unmute the microphone. Thanks. Okay, Namaskar, Chan. And my name is Dorje Daniel, and I'm a student at IBC. And today I have a question for our Prajan Ita Tamo Biku. That I I was always like thinking about this thing that how do you practice the mindfulness meditation if you have like childhood trauma or like you grow up in a violent family like growing up in that kind of environment uh, you grow up so how do you practice and what kind of meditation would be helpful for for like some person who grow up with this kind of trauma and to how develop like self-compassion to develop more self strengths awareness and to have compassion to other people or, and to to themselves too so how do you practice this mindfulness meditation for this kind of person specifically mm -hmm. and thank you very much this is my question can i ask you i mean i could probably tell you my my answer but i'll ask you what is trauma 
trauma could be you growing up with some aggressive father and thinking not, about not, that not kind the, of violence. Yeah, okay. Not not the example, but the actual what is trauma? Trauma could be like something every day, some person thinking not, about not the example, but the th yeah, the thinking a lot. Yeah. And why are they thinking a lot? Because that could be influenced their their some period of time when they were a the child or when they grow up being like they were experiencing this kind of thing every time and that that thing could be stuck in their mind and it's coming okay, like man. every day when they see some stuff, right? It's coming every day. Good. It's coming every day when they're seeing stuff. So um, why I ask is because trauma is one of these things that, that become a thing. Like if suppose someone has PTSD, that becomes a thing that they have, like, like this thing that I have, right? It's a thing. But when you break it down, you you take it on another from another perspective and that's what mindfulness does my answer is that i really do think mindfulness is the answer because a person doesn't have tra trauma they do but that's only a conceptual way of talking about it and we don't want to focus on the conceptual level if a person has depression anxiety we actually don't want them to identify with having this thing that you can call anxiety or depression or PTSD. You know PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, it's basically what you're talking about, they, the term they use, PTSD. Um, because you can't fix that. You can't fix concepts in general, just to, to, to cut to the chase. But we when we, we try to, we try to, to figure out what is the answer to my problem? My problem is trauma. What is the answer to it? And because trauma is just a concept, it's like a, a billiard ball. You can't dissect it. It's a thing. What, if, what happens if you cut trauma in half? Just a joke. No, you, 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 you can't. It's trauma. Trauma isn't divisible. But our experiences are divisible into individual experiences and so our habits and this is a key word habit is divisible into moments where we reinforce the habit and we cultivate the habit because that's what that, that's a part of what trauma is it's not the whole story but the reason why trauma becomes unmanageable is because it becomes habitual and because we, we reinforce the habit. So meditation is all about habits. It's about growing new habits. It's about cutting down old habits. And it's about understanding our existing habits. Those three things, they're, they're part of the same practice. It's not three different things. But those are the results. You build up good habits. You cut down bad habits. And the main catalyst that allows you to do that is seeing your habits, seeing the nature of habits. Now, the thing about trauma, the real thing about it, in my mind, is its intensity. Why trauma is an issue is because you had an intense reaction. And then you repeated that intense reaction. This isn't normal habits. This is something that an ordinary person cannot cope with. Most people cannot cope with. Suppose a person is, excuse me, raped or sexually assaulted. That's a thing that is very hard to cope with. It, it's an overload of your emotion. And so it, you, you have an intense negative reaction about that. And, 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 and that reaction disturbs you. And it encourages the thinking about the thing that you reacted to, which makes you react again. And again, and again, and again, and it, 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 it creates a feedback loop. And that, that, that's how the habit is started. So habits are a thing that meditation, mindfulness meditation deals with. But the problem with trauma is it's extreme, it's the intensity. That's all. That's the only difference. Any mental illness, anxiety, depression, phobias, they, they're all ha habits. They have, you know, there's more to them, but essentially what's causing the problem 
is that you're habituating them, you're, you're reinforcing them and, and reiterate, reifying them. So the only difference with trauma is it's the, it's the intense ones. It's the ones that were so intense that we just can't even cope. And it's hard for meditators to cope with. That being said, it's not impossible. And it's not something that meditation can't deal with. Meditation can deal with this. Give someone who has trauma, PTSD of any sort, give, give them the, 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 the environment and the instruction and give them the, the wholesome qualities of mind as a what we call upanisaya that they have to have from past lives and so on that make them a good person, right? A good person with PTSD, the, the goodness inside of them will support them uh, along with having a good teacher, along with having a good environment. And mindfulness is all they need. I mean, mindfulness as a, as a core is all they need with all the you know, keeping ethical precepts and all of that. But you know, basically undertaking in the proper environment mindfulness. I've, I've had people who, who have gone through what I would say is pretty extreme PTSD, uh, childhood trauma. And childhood trauma that they, 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 they just, you could see it after so many years that they were, they were just at, on their last uh, thread, hanging by, 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 the, by the, a thread. I'd say in English, uh, and and could see how mindfulness help mindfulness changes that it brings you back, it gives you life again, it changes your perspective, it takes you out of that realm of concepts. This person hurt me. All of that is just conceptual, and it reinforces this impossible situation because you can't divide it. It's a it's a thing that happened. You can't change it. You can't say make it not have happened. Uh, it, and the change in perspective is to the qualities of mind that, or the states of mind that that bring up that experience, that evoke a memory. Because what is a memory? A memory isn't the past; it's now. It's a thought right now. And no matter what you think, no matter what you see, no matter what you hear right now, these are only experiences. They're only seeing. They're only hearing. And so mindfulness helps remind you of that. The word mindfulness actually should be uh, remembering because that's what sati means. Sati means remembering or the ability to remember, the capacity to remember. And then this, the meaning is remember the experience for what it is. Remember that it's just seeing, it's just hearing and so on. Thank you very much, Ajahn, for answering your question. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for your question. So next, um, Pro William, right? Pro William, and then next turn is uh, Venerable Sujita. Okay, first, uh, Venerable William, Pro William, so please. Uh, namaste, again, Ajahn. Uh, uh, I must admit, I'm a little bit nervous because um, I think almost seven years ago, I first watched your recordings about uh, Vipassana practice. So I feel like I've known you for a long time, uh, but it may not be the same experience for you right now. <laughs> um, but my question is that um, I've recently changed uh, my, I guess, my regular life from living in a very quiet village temple, not seeing many people and having time to practice. Uh, from there, I've moved to Bangkok and I've begun tertiary studies. So my life is incredibly busy now with <clears throat> lots of things to do, lots of um, agitations and stimulations. And um, I wonder if you could offer any advice with what that's all about, I guess, and uh, techniques or ways to, to manage that um, that sudden change of circumstances. Yeah. Well, you have to accept that during the time that you're studying, you're abandoning uh, a, a type of meditation or a level of mindfulness, a level of meditation. You just can't be expected to maintain it. It's a bali, bali bodha. It's a obstacle to meditation practice. So that being said, 
there's no excuse really for not having a daily meditation routine. And I think that's essential because there are times where you might not be meditating every day. And that's what's going to get in the way. That's what's really going to cause problems. So my recommendation is absolutely uh, ensure that you have a daily meditation practice, a formal meditation practice. Uh, on top of that, of course, things like daily meditation, uh, day, daily life meditation, where you're mindful walking down the street and so on. But I think absolutely, um, I mean, don't don't be too be hard on yourself when you're not able to do it, but consider that to be a goal to to maintain a, you know, how am I going to get back on track if you get off track daily meditation make sure you're doing some every day and always strive for that but you also do to some extent have to think um, during this time my meditation is not going to be the same and it is my intention to pick it back up again once I have finished my studies don't fall into the trap of, of becoming a study monk. That's what I, I would say. I don't know if that's such a thing, but you wouldn't want to think of yourself, okay, oh, I'll just be a, I'll just keep studying and, and meditating as well or something. You really shouldn't. You should give up your studies once you're ready to commit yourself to practice. I think that's what I'm scared of the most is, uh, yeah, suddenly becoming, getting used to being a study monk and practice becoming something which I'll get around to. You know, so, uh, yeah. but, uh, thank you yeah, so yeah, much I mean, for your advice. You do kind of have to, I mean, it, it's, it's orthodox. I mean, it's according to the texts. You do have to say you are, you are putting aside your meditation when you, when you study. You, you should have a daily practice. You can have a daily practice, but it's not going to be the same. And you have to be aware that you're going to have to eventually convert back to giving up your studies i mean you, you really should you don't have to of course it's 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 in reality possible for a person studying at university to become enlightened of course because it, it's just reality but it's it's not practically feasible and it's not the it's not the way you should do it it's not the way it should be done so you have to think of it uh, to follow tradition uh, eventually give up your study again. Thank you so much, Ajahn. Okay, thank you so much. Next available, Sujita, right? Yes. Good morning, Ajahn. And also, for <clears throat> this group, my dumb brother and sister. So I'm really appreciate all this. QA mindfulness practice. So <clears throat> I'm really confused about when we practice. So those who, those who are usually practice meditation, so there are so many techniques. If we summarize, there are two things. So Samatha and Vipassana, this is a real meditation. So Samatha can draw Samadhi, Vipassana can draw Panya. So and here I a little copious where there is meditation center. They did a mention about preset, sila. There is three things, sila, samadhi, penya. So firstly, we should fight the sila, after that, samadhi and penya. So everywhere, every teacher, so they mention only uh, samatha and vipassana to fight this meditation. So, but I don't understand why they never mention about sila. This is a precept. So without precept, we can practice meditation or not. So mm -hmm. everywhere have precept. So for human, five precept, for man, two to seven. So something like that. So without precept, so we can develop our, our concentration, our vipassana meditation, something like that. So I just a little bit confused about this one. Why they don't mm -hmm. mention about Sila? This is a very important for our Buddhist community. So mm -hmm. my question is how to practice meditation with the Buddhist perspective. So the Buddhist way, meditation techniques, the real meditation techniques. 
how to fight this type of stuff. So thank you so much, Ajahn. <coughs> So I'll take, um, I have to say a few things. Um, samatha doesn't come from samadhi and vipassana doesn't come from panya. Now, I'm not exactly disagreeing with you, but um, we have to not conflate the two. So it's true that samatha is basically samadhi and vipassana is basically panya. But the meditation practice is both samadhi. Vipassana meditation is still samadhi because you're actually not practicing vipassana. You cannot practice vipassana. Let's be clear about this. In vipassana meditation, no one ever practices vipassana. And this is not just a theory, not just a theoretical point. It's an important practical point because what does vipassana mean? It means to see the three characteristics, really, basically, very briefly, to see anicca, dukkha, and anatta. You cannot practice that. And meditators who hear this, will try to practice it. We'll sit down and try to see impermanence, suffering, and non-self. That's not how meditation is conducted. Vipassana is the result of vipassana meditation. I'll say it again. Vipassana is the result of vipassana meditation. The meditation itself is what? It's actually satipatthana. You don't practice vipassana, you practice satipatthana vipassana. I'm not yet answering your question, but just to, to, to be clear here what we're talking about. Samatha meditation, the result of samatha meditation is samatha. You don't actually even practice samatha. You practice meditation, kamatana, you can say, and there's mindfulness there, but the mindfulness is not focused on uh, paramatha dhamma. So because of that, the result is samatha. So that's why uh, you might say that vipassana is panya and samatha is, is samadhi, but they are both samadhi. The difference is if you have samadhi here, vipassana goes to the next step. Samatha does not. Samatha cannot go, cannot go here. So you have samadhi, because of samadhi, then there is panya. But here, no panya. There cannot be, because you cannot see anicca, dukkha, and anatta. You cannot see clearly. So samatha only stays at samadhi. That's the point. It can never make the jump to panya, not without switching to practice vipassana. So that's the first thing. That doesn't answer your question, but I just wanted to say that technically they are both samadhi. And you're perfectly right to point out that you need sila to cultivate samadhi. You're also perfectly in your right to point out that perhaps some meditation centers uh, de-emphasize sila. There are meditation centers that don't even talk about sila. They don't require you to stop killing, stealing, lying, cheating, drugs and alcohol. Some meditation centers, not in our traditions, of course, but uh, some meditation centers in the world don't have a problem with drugs and alcohol or even killing. They're killing animals, insects, and so on. But truth be told, I would take issue with the... I would point out to you um, that sila is not just the precepts. And in fact, I would argue that the precepts themselves are not actually sila. The precepts themselves are guidelines. They are like, I, I always compare them to fence posts. If you're going to make a fence, you need posts, right? 
the posts tell you where the fence is going to be. But if you put up a bunch of fence posts, you're not going to keep your horses in the corral. You're not going to keep your cows in the pasture with just fence posts because they're not the fence. That's why they are not sila. The reason why people kill is because they have the inclination to kill, because they have allowed their minds to give rise to the mind states that cause them to kill. So true sila, most especially for the purpose of cultivating samadhi, is the fourth type of sila, which is indriya, or not, I mean, this, I don't know, it's one of the four, it's the guarding of the faculties, indriya samwara sila. Because there's no categorical difference between hitting someone, hitting a person out of anger and walking around with anger. Suppose you get angry at someone and you stomp around the house, boom, boom, boom. We can say that is dusila because that is action that is immoral. Walking around every step you take with anger when you stomp your foot out of anger, that's the same. It's not categorically different from punching someone. It is the expression of the, the physical expression caused by anger. There's anger in your mind and that causes you to stomp around. It causes you to hurt people. It causes you to say things. But if you shout in your room and there's no one around to hear, if you're shouting out of anger, it's still dusila, it's still unwholesome. And most importantly for meditation, it's still going to hurt your, your, your practice of, of mindfulness. So I would redirect your thinking to say that mindfulness is where we start. And mindfulness will take you through sila, samadhi, and panya. Now, I'm not saying a person who starts meditation shouldn't keep the precepts. But keeping the precepts is like putting down fence posts. If you see the fence posts, you know where your fence is. And you can judge when you're crossing the fence, when you're on the wrong side of the fence. Keeping down the knowing killing is if you know that killing is wrong, then anytime you have the desire to kill something, you know you've crossed the fence. It helps you, but that's all it does. I can say panati patavi ramani sikapadangsu, and I can still go out and kill. The precept didn't help me at all. Why? Because I was too unmindful. But mindfulness takes you through all three. If you're focused on ultimate reality, when you walk, you can't walk with anger when you're mindful. You can't speak with anger. You can't hurt someone with mindfulness. So you have sila, samadhi, because you're focused on the object clearly, seeing it as it is, samadhi. The clarity of seeing creates an understanding of anicca, dukkha, ananatta. That's panya. Oh, that's my idea. That's my answer for you. Okay. Um, next questions. Um, pra Putong, Pra Putong, right? I'm so sorry that I maybe missed. Okay. Please. Master Gan, Kava Gan. Good morning. Uh, since I can have said that uh, our mind likes to grab on a conceptual level. So mm -hmm. I'm not really clear about what is the conceptual and the ultimate truth. I'm not clear about these two things. And finally, how can the duplication based on non-conceptual uh, 
reality or concept so truth so how can we do that at that so um take the example of hearing a dog bark hearing if you hear a dog bark how do you know it's a real dog barking what if i said to you it's just a recording of a dog someone has a, a big speaker and they're or or maybe it's a human being making a noise like a dog or maybe it's a bird that can sound like a dog right so when you hear a dog the dog is not real you cannot know that the dog is real. That's not, it's not important whether you do know, but I'm trying to help you to understand the, the thing about concepts is they're not actually real. That's different from the experience of hearing. Hearing is real. What did you hear? We don't know. But the hearing was real. That's the difference between ultimate reality and conceptual reality. It doesn't matter whether the dog exists. Suppose there's a dog behind your kuti and you hear the dog. The whole, anything to do with dog is all happening in your mind, in your heart, right? In, in your mind. I point to the head, but it's, it's not like that. It, in your mind there arises the dog. The dog is not over there behind your kuti. The dog is in your mind. And where does it come from? Where does the dog come from? Not over there. The dog comes from the hearing. The only reason dog arises is as a result of the hearing. Hearing first, and then your mind says dog. What if it was a bird that sounded like a dog? Uh, ghosts. People in Thailand are very much afraid of ghosts. When I first went to Thailand, I wasn't a monk, of course, mm -hmm. and my name was my name is Noah. So I was in Chiang Mai, outside of Chiang Mai, in the in the in in the countryside, and in the middle of the night, I heard this noise, Noah. Noah, Noah, and I heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it. Oh, and it scared the heck out of me. I was so scared. There's a dog, there's a bird in Chiang Mai that makes a noise. Noah, Noah. <laughs> they still laugh about it. My uncle still laughs about it. Oh, yes, the, we have the Noah bird here. Because I told him about it. I said, I, last night, I don't know what I heard, but it was like a ghost calling my name. There was the sound, and my mind processed that sound as my name. The bird wasn't calling my name. It didn't even know my name. I created it in my mind, and then I created more. You know, in Thai we say prung teng, right? There was, no, there was no Noah. It wasn't calling Noah. There was no ghost. There was just a bird. So the concepts are things like that. If you want to put it in meditation terms, let's take a, a real example of meditation. Metta meditation. When you say to yourself, may all beings be happy. Or let's, to make it simple, talk about one being. And so they talk about in the Visuddhi Manga, a meditation practice of focusing on someone who you don't like someone who you have anger towards. So you think about that person and you think, may that person be happy. Your object at that time is a concept. Your object is the person. But where is the person? The person is in your mind. You're conceiving of a person and you're using that person to evoke in your mind love kindness, metta, when you say to yourself, may they be happy, in your mind, there arises metta. But your object is a person. No matter how concentrated you become, 
because there's no connection, no engagement with ultimate reality, no engagement with experience, your thoughts are on what? On the person, that person. May they be happy. Thinking about them happy, thinking to yourself, I wish for them to be happy, imagining them happy, that sort of thing, is all concepts. Put it really simply, it's it's mental, it's mental construct, you create it in the mind. It's not what you're actually experiencing. So for in this case, for example, if instead you think about a person and you get angry, instead of saying, Oh, oh may they be happy, you know, replace the anger with, with love. If you focus on the anger and you said, angry, angry. And if you focused on the thought and say thinking, or when you see the person and you say seeing, then you're focused on the actual moments of experience that when you put them together, they become hatred or they become love. If you focus on those moments of experience, that's ultimate reality. It's easiest to appreciate when you actually practice uh, satipatthana vipassana because then you make that shift and you realize to start that your own body doesn't even exist. When I look at, like, you look at your hand, right? Like you look at the fist. Oh, where did the fist go? But that, that's a silly example, but that's what happens. You, you close your eyes and over time, your body disappears. It's like, wow, my body disappeared. But what's actually true is that your mind is now no longer perceiving what isn't there. Because when you close your eyes, what is there? There's not a body. There's experiences, physical sensations that remind you body, body. But they're not body. They're experiences. They arise and they cease. When you make that shift, when you only experience your experiences and, and perceive your experiences, then you're on the, on the level of ultimate reality. That's where vipassana arises. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure that this finished for you this question, right? <laughs> okay, so next, um, uh, brother Dujun, brother Dujun. Yes, please. Morning, Ajah. Yes. Uh, sorry, we cannot we cannot hear you clearly. About uh, the technical, which was and that something with matters they talk about us already, and they also okay. Can you hear me? Okay, okay please Hello? repeat your question again. No, <laughs> maybe your internet is not good sometimes. Okay, could you please repeat your question again? Okay, maybe you, you come again, I think. <laughs> okay, you can put your 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 question uh, in the chat box. I think I have learned that in the clinic that uh, when I look, sorry, sorry. Uh, other one. Can... 
first or later logging again. Later, later, later. <laughs> cannot okay. hear. We cannot hear you clearly, so let's. Uh, you can you put can in the chat later. box. Okay. Uh, B A to Huang T, right? Huang T. Pikuni Huang T. Okay, please. Yes, uh, good morning, Achan and everybody. So today I have a question for you. Um, so when I do meditation, because uh, my topper is I have a pain back and, you know, I can't do sitting for a long time. But in my Mahayana tradition, I can incorporate meditation and mindfulness to my daily basis. But it is a tall order. It's quite you know, a uh, challenging task for me as a beginner. Um, even as you know, I know the concepts of uh, vipassana and see things as they are, um, they they uh, as they are. But in a daily basis, when I live with the people, some of people, uh, you know, who always make a things with me and off at me. And at the time, I try to change my mind and I always try to send out my compassion for them. And I also with them happy. I don't push out my anger for them. Even I want to burn down. Uh, but after that, um, at that time, I can deal with it. I can, you know, uh, have my fullness and I, I don't react with their uh, bad actions. But after that, I, I know that I'm, a, um, you know, an overthinker. And I overthink again. I move over and over again, and it's stuck in my mind for quite a long. I uh, I want to ask you, um, do you know uh, you know any solution how to reduce terrible time? Just think about how much they hurt me, and I know that uh, I myself is impermanent, emptiness, and the feeling is just a feeling. Feelings is uh, impermanent, rising, falling like that. I know very clearly, but how to apply it to gain the good to, you know, a better resort is so difficult for me. So thank you for my question. Okay, so you have to be able to separate intellectual knowing from experiential knowing. Because if you know impermanence or suffering or non-self, you're already enlightened. And, and you would never have a problem. So we don't know. Uh, even, even knowing intellectually, you have to put that aside. It's not going to help you. Thinking about things, setting your mind in a certain way, saying, I will be nice to these people. I will not get angry. You have to set that aside. You have to study. Think of it like an, uh, a study course. What you're studying is your mind. You're studying your experience. That's all. You're not trying to fix it. Because trying to fix it is like um, just getting yourself more stuck in it. Because when you try to fix something, you've already decided that it's a problem. You're already creating a problem. In order to fix, you need a problem. Vipassana meditation isn't about fixing problems. It's an important advice for everyone, a reminder. Vipassana meditation is not about fixing problems. It's about understanding experiences. So you have, to sh you have to make the shift there as well. Our or uh, an ordinary way of looking at reality is problems, solutions, fixing. And so everything is a problem, fix, problem to fix. What is the solution? You think about the solution. Vipassana, the shift you make is to see it not as a problem, but as an experience, as moments of experience. And they are not to be solved, they are to be understood, or they are to be seen clearly. And the result of seeing clearly is not a solution, it's understanding. Understanding 
doesn't solve your problems, it changes them. It, it helps you see through them that they are not problems. It helps you see the truth of your reality. And that doesn't mean you don't act on a conceptual level to solve your problems, but your mind is not focused on them as problems. You're able to solve all your problems. All of life's issues become much easier to solve because you're focused on the reality behind them. You're seeing what's really happening. If it's with a person, a person who is angry at you or you're angry at them, you're no longer blinded by them, the person, the angry person or the bad person. You're no longer blinded by your own anger, your idea of what they did to you or what, how they act, what they said and how they act towards you. You're seeing, oh, there's anger here and there's anger here and there's sound coming from here and there's hearing here. And you understand, ah, yes, they have a lot, there's a lot of anger there. And so, you know, maybe to avoid that person. But because you're seeing it clearly, you don't get angry yourself. You don't react, you don't judge. That's um, a very general sort of answer. I would say, practically, try to avoid people who make you angry. Try your best to stay to yourself and surround yourself with people who are supportive and to give you the space to practice. Also, don't surround yourself with people who like to talk to you and, and engage with you and distract you from the practice. But try and stay away from those people you have real difficulties with. One uh, misunderstanding, I think, that often comes up is people think that in order to understand your problems, you have to have problems. You have to engage with them. And that running away from them is, is, is a bad thing. Running away as an attitude is a bad thing. But finding a place where you can begin to make sense of your reality and, and have the, the, the conducive environment to do that, it's not running away. It's like creating a laboratory. Like if you want to study COVID, you can't just go up and take a magnifying glass to the people who have COVID. You have to isolate it in a laboratory. And you have to be very careful with it because otherwise you might catch it. But if you have, but so you can't just go on the street and say, Let, can I, excuse me, can I study your COVID? No, <laughs> find someone who has it and study. No, that would be disastrous. Go away, go into your laboratory, have a protected environment where you can study. And be, from studying, then you can create a vaccine and you can uh, take it out into the world. So be, uh, appreciate the uh, wholesomeness of what we call a retreat, where you take time to uh, simplify and, and protect yourself from the things that trigger your, your mental problems. You can take that as an attitude. Of course, in life, we cannot control, but quite often we encourage. We, we have to engage with certain people, so we engage with them. Rather than uh, protecting ourselves, we get caught up in, in the things that we have to engage with. You always have uh, choices. To, as to the level of your engagement. Even if you have to talk to people, have to meet with people, have to live with people, you don't have to engage with them, and most especially engage with their defilements. When I came back from my first meditation course in Thailand, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know up or down or anything. 
And I remember my parents yelling at me, saying, you're just like a zombie. Because I was, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to engage with them. I didn't, I didn't know how to be because the old person I was, was, was rotten, was, was not a very good person. I couldn't be that person anymore. So I remember they were yelling and I would just close my eyes and say, rising, falling. And then when they yell, hearing, hearing. They, they got more, they got angry because of that, but I, I had no choice. I had to protect myself because I didn't know how to talk to them. I didn't know much about Buddhism. I went into meditation without any knowledge of Buddhism really. All that I learned in the beginning was from that meditation course. Uh, and so it took me a long time to be able to engage properly. But absolutely, I think you have to protect yourself. You have to disengage. And your way of engaging with the world has to change because it will change. And that will sometimes make people upset. But that's only because change upsets people. It's not your fault. We think we have to, right? If someone's engaging us, we think, oh, well, I have to chat with them. And you don't have to. If they get upset because you're no fun anymore, because you're not entertaining, because you're not friendly, that's only them getting upset because of their attachment, because of their lobha, their dosa, their moha. So one, just one question there to try and protect yourself. Okay. Let's uh, move to next question. Um, we have three students. Um, Dujun, Tita Meta, Tita Meta, and uh, Sikamana. So I will move to Dujun first, and the second one is uh, Venerable Tita. Tita Meta and Sikha Mana. Okay. Uh, please, uh, Dujun. Hello, Hojun. My name is Tita Meta. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And, it's okay. Oh, sorry. Did someone else need to ask the question? Yes, yeah, please. Yes, please. please. Ah, okay. okay, thank you. So, my question I am a Estonian monk, and my question is Is it possible to see things? as they really are when the five hindrances are active. Thank you. Not at the moment. You have, to, you have to see it a little more granular than that. Because what does it mean to say the five hindrances are active? Does that mean for an hour they're active? No. That's not how the mind works. Hindrances aren't active. They arise. They arise in the mind. And they're momentary. In the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha talks about taking the five hindrances as an object of meditation. And that's a bit controversial. Or you hear people seem, who seem to say the opposite, say that you can't. Um, it's tricky because obviously they cloud the mind. And they create results that are going to be uh, habit, habits of, of blindness. There's no question. And there's no question that in order to really see clearly, you have to, you have to reduce and remove them from the mind. But so, so it's not quite a simple answer. I would say two things. One, that technically... Even the hindrances can be an object of meditation, but even in the beginning, you're not going to have hindrances all the time. And so the mindfulness is fighting with those hindrances. But the second part of the answer is that absolutely not. In the end, to truly see clearly, you have to completely shut them down. And so... That's just a gradual process uh, of eventually having mindfulness overwhelm the hindrances. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, Tita Meta, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay then let's move to uh do june right do june yes I once again. okay uh thank you Ajah. uh Molly, i want to ask some questions about uh, the the forest uh, sangha tradition mm, i learned that when the practice <laughs> That's not me, is it? Uh, they also chanting uh, Buddha, Buddha, breath in. Okay. Hello. Hello. I'm sorry, we cannot hear you clearly, brother. Uh, maybe. Oh. <laughs> It's quite clear at the end. Okay, so could you uh, put your question in the chat box, brother Tujun? Okay, uh, let's move to Sikhamana, right? Sikhamana, uh, sister. Okay, please. Yes, uh, good morning, Ajahn, and good morning, all the more. All my class, all my friends. So I have the one question. Um, all the time, I have one time. All the time, I also I turn always pay attention to British meditation. Um, maybe one day I practice ten hour for city meditation and walking meditation, and I don't, I don't see and I don't talk any people, but. At that time, I have the more concentration. I can observe my breathing in and breathing out from to the end, from uh, start to the end. But after that, I have I have time to study. But I know I cannot uh, continue to keep concentration like the time I practice. So, and sometimes I try to remind me practice meditation with daily activity, but. It uh it made me very difficult and if I pay more attention to practice meditation, so after that I cannot do like I cannot talk with the, any of my friend. Uh, I don't want to, I I don't want to learn. Uh, sometimes like that. So I had the one question: How I can make the pattern when I live with my friend or when I do something in my temple? Because when I do my my just look at inside and want to practice meditation and don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what sort of meditation do you practice? Uh, I practice Vipassana meditation, uh, observe falling and rising. Okay. And you say to yourself, rising, falling? No, no I, don't, I don't say, I just observe. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would I would uh, offer you the suggestion of trying yeah. to use a mantra. Yeah. So when yeah. when there's rising and falling, actually say to yourself, "Rising, falling," because it sounds like you might be um, focused too much on on, and it's not too much, but focused on the concentration on yes. the. The, the quiet mind, right? Yes. You don't you don't need that for vipassana. So if you try to use the mantra, then you can pick it up every moment, and you get what is called kanika samadhi, momentary momentary concentration. So every time, even if you're upset, you can say to yourself, "Upset." It reminds you. I, I could give a whole talk on why the mantra is important, but in brief, do you know what the proximate cause of sati is? The proximate cause. The proximate cause of sati this is very technical and theoretical, but the proximate cause of sati is something called tira sanya. This is what creates mindfulness. Yes. Tira sanya. 
tira means strong or firm and sanya you know sanya is is perception or recognition so when you say to yourself um upset or when you say to yourself pain pain or, or when you say to yourself restless restless you are reminding yourself you are reinforcing that recognition you say oh i'm distracted but when you repeat to yourself distracted distracted it repeats it reinforces and strengthens the perception that keeps you from flying off the handle from getting lost and and getting distracted getting and getting upset about it it doesn't make you quiet but that's not important remember in in vipassana we want to see impermanence suffering yes. and non-self and if you putting that aside if you look at the four noble truths what is the first noble truth What is the first noble truth, you know? The first noble truth is dukkha. Suffering. Suffering. What are we supposed to do about dukkha? Uh, with the dukkha, I just, I just What are observe. we supposed to do? No, no. What are we supposed to do according to the first noble truth? According to the Buddha? What are we supposed to do? What should we do? Have to believe. Dukkha? Have to what? Have to believe that is the suffering. No. To know as, as a dukkha. You have to what? To know we as should a dukkha. Know. We should know the dukkha. Dukkha okay. as a dukkha is, a, is almost. A... That's almost the answer. <laughs> I, I won't accept it because that's not the word. The word is parinyaya. Many of you know this word, right? Yes. Parinyaya, to know pari, like parinibbana. Pari means all around completely. So what we're supposed to do is understand dukkha, to, to, to know it completely. So remember that when you think, oh, why, I wish I could be quiet. I wish I could be peaceful. I wish I could be calm. That's not exactly the important thing. The import, it, it is useful. To be calm is useful, but it can also distract you. And when you cannot be calm, when you're living in life and, and in school and so on, you miss the point if you focus too much on the calm that you don't have and how you're distracted. The point is it dukkha. You know? Dukkha because of what? Because anicca, because anatta. Yes. Right? So if you apply mindfulness without worrying about focusing and concentrating and quieting the mind, but just seeing it's coming, it's going, it's coming, it's going. Seeing moment by moment. And you can you can gain insight, you can find peace. You find a different kind of peace that doesn't require your mind to stop thinking. Doesn't require you to have a stable experience. You become more flexible. So so I would recommend consider to try uh, using the mantra rising yeah. falling because it will keep you moments moments and if you just observe you you, you get into more samat samatha yeah. yes maybe a breath is more concentration i think so i, I yeah. think it's common that thing that happened yes uh, so try using the mantra when you feel pain you can say to yourself pain pain if you're thinking, you can say thinking. If you're distracted, you can say distracted, distract. Liking, disliking, drowsiness, distraction, doubt, the five nivarana. If you like, you can say liking, liking. If you dislike, say, you don't say out loud, of course, but in your mind, you, you remind yourself. Uh, liking, liking, disliking, and seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. You can use a mantra, actually. Remind yourself. That's tira sanya. That gives rise to sati. Because I think I will practice concentration the first, and after that, I will change to practice vipassana. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the, the way to with my You way. can, but if you want to do that, technically, you should go off into the forest and, and live alone. <laughs> if you want samatha, stop studying, go off in the forest. You yeah, can't so just say, I'll do a little bit of samatha. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes I want to stop studying. <laughs> 
Yes, that's a good thing. Yeah. But either way, vipassana is is the essence. What you need is, you know, it goes through all three: sila, samadhi, panya. This yeah. is vipassana goes through all three. Thank you, Ajahn, very much. I will change my rubbish. Okay, we have another question that's very interesting. Uh, from Brother Dujun, right? Okay, he asked that when the Thai forest tradition recite the Bhutto while practice Anapanasati, it is the Samadhi or Vipassana practice or both? Thank you. Mm -hmm. The answer is it's Samatha practice. This is my answer. Well, someone else might give a different answer. Um, but I want, I, I, I think I should say something. I'll try to be brief and not get into too much detail, but I like your follow-up point because it's different to say buddho when practicing anapanasati than it is to just reciting buddha or buddho, buddho. And here's how it's different. Well, I don't really experientially know how it's different because I've never practiced either. But going by the texts, which we should, it's important to appreciate your own practice, no question. But it's also important to, un to be humble and understand that your own practice may not be perfect. Your own understanding, even if you are an arahant, <laughs> even an arahant's understanding is not perfect. And if you're not an arahant, all the more reason to be humble and understand that uh, the tradition says certain things about, about meditation practice. And it's not just tradition. I can also say from secondhand experience, what I've seen in others. So what I'm getting at, here's the issue. If you say to yourself, buddho, buddho, and you're contemplating that quality of the Buddha. It's complicated because the Buddha is a concept, but that quality of mind is technically an ultimate reality. So I don't think that really matters. I think a person who practices buddho is much more likely to give rise to samatha, uh, to give rise to, to samatha uh, tranquility than they are to actually get vipassana because they're focused on a quality of mind. Because you don't focus on that quality of mind. You focus on the conceptual idea of a person who knows, right? Buddho, pulu. That's orthodox. orthodox. That's, that's, that's Buddhist, Theravada Buddhist practice. When a person, and this is going to be controversial, what I'm going to say now, but it shouldn't be. It, it, well, it may reflect my lack of understanding. I might be ignorant. So take this with, this is my idea, and I might be wrong, but it's what I've thought. And I'll give some reason why I feel confident saying it. Two reasons. <laughs> When you say to yourself, buddho, and you focus on the breath, you're no longer practicing orthodox meditation. You're no longer practicing Theravada meditation practice. You're mixing two techniques, right? I think you've kind of picked up on that because of your second point. When a person focuses on anapanasati and says, buddho, buddho, I'm not quite sure what they're doing. And so that's my first reason for questioning it is because the texts don't support it, as far as I know. I don't, I've read the Visuddhimagga, we've studied the Visuddhimagga. That text doesn't support it, as far as I can see. But the second thing, and this is even more, more interesting and probably more controversial as well, When you start mixing techniques, there is at least the potential for mixing results, 
for confused results. There are teachers, um, practitioners, let's say, of Buddha, Buddha, who begin, in my mind, to confuse the breath and the knowing of the breath with Buddha. And so they will say, Puru, the one who knows, is this knowing of the breath. And if you focus Buddha, Buddha long enough, there will only be the one who knows. And if you listen to them talk or read what they've said, I'm concerned that they have actually fallen into Atta, the idea of self, Puru. And it's because of, in my mind, this confusion. I've, see, I've heard this. And that conclusion comes also from seeing another similar tradition that you might not have realized is actually quite similar. And that is watching a, uh, imagining a crystal. Many of you know what, what I'm talking about, right? Imagining a crystal coming down to your center of gravity. Yes. And saying to yourself, Samma Arahang, Samma Arahang. Again, mixing two valid meditation techniques, but mixing them in a way that I don't think they should be mixed. And the result is similar in some cases. Now, in, in all cases, it is certainly possible for these to be valid meditation techniques and, and for a person to become even enlightened based on this sort of practice. But it's not going to be because of the practice per se. And, and it's much more likely, I think, for the practice to create complicated results, confused results. And so as a result, you, you, you hear and read about people with, who, who practice this coming up with new theories and new ideas. Nibbana is atta, which some of you may have heard was being thrown around. The idea that the mind is this big and it exists at the center of, of, of gravity because it's complicated. You're, you're complicating things by, by, by bringing together two meditation techniques in a way that you know, they aren't related. You're, you're creating a connection that isn't there, right? At least if you say in one, out one, in two, out two, there's a connection. The numbers are conceptual, but it is true. This is the first in-breath. This is the second in-breath. There's a connection. It's simple, right? But to introduce Buddha into your breath, Sama Arahang or Buddha complicates it. And the results from what I can see as an outsider, are complicated and confused in my mind and unorthodox. And, and so there's a danger there. It's not true that, it's not necessarily true that it's always going to be like that and that they can't be used for great good. Uh, I mean, I think in general, meditation, even like that, is generally good. But on a deep level, it seems to create some wrong view potentially, or, or uh, foster or encourage or harbor worldviews. So that wasn't quite your question, but your question of whether they are samatha or vipassana, it's a difficult one. And I would say qualified, they're all still in the realm of samatha. Because ask yourself, are any of them focused on an ultimate reality, on an experience? Even anapanasati is, is borderline, because if you're focused on breath going in, that's not the actual experience. It's conceptual. If you think of in, nothing's going in. That's not what you're experiencing. That's, that's how you conceive it. The reality is the, the, the heat or the coolness at the nose, the feeling in the throat, which arises and ceases here, arises and ceases at the chest, arises and ceases at the stomach. 
if you focus on those, then anapanasati in and of itself can be vipassana. I mean, I think what we do, watch the stomach rising and falling, could be called anapanasati, but it's also vipassana because it's focused on the ultimate reality. The, the, the four elements, the tension in the, in the stomach. But why I say qualified is because it's really not worth mentioning, but technically the qualities of the Buddha are technically ultimate realities, right? Because they're qualities of mind, but they're not really. That's not how people practice it. That's not how anyone really practices it. So you're not really likely to, to give rise to vipassana as a result of focusing on the qualities of the Buddha. Okay, thank you so much, Tanajan Yudha Tamo. Unfortunately, that we have short time, and I do believe that uh, everyone uh, get the knowledge and useful technique about our practicing inside meditation and also uh, samatha kamatana as well, the difference and the knowledge and. At the end of the session, so I would like to invite a representative of our students to say thank you to Tanajan uh, at the end of the session. So please. Tanajan, uh, we are very honored today with your presence with us. Uh, kindly accept our gratitude, respect, and deep appreciation for this wonderful treasure of Dharma knowledge we have received from Ajahn uh, for uh, shedding lights and straightening views on various issues relating to meditation experiences and practices. Thank you. Thank you. And also we would like to express our gratitude and respect to Ajahn Virasa and IPSC for organizing this today's session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here and uh, honored that I was invited, that Tan Maha invited me directly. I, that's very kind and thoughtful. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Uh, doing a question and answer period seems more, uh, more appropriate because I don't know any of you. <laughs> so I don't know what to teach you. But when you ask questions, then I know what to teach. Then I know what you want to learn. So Not many our problems and issues. If you have a topic that you want me to talk for longer on, then I could. But it seems that asking questions is quite valuable. So thank you for the opportunity for inviting me. Sorry. Sorry. Next time we will invite Hanajan to chair knowledge once again. Next time. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your kindness. So at the end of the session, uh, please everyone turn on your camera and then we'll flick, uh, take photo group together. Okay. Okay, start from first page one, two, and the second page one, two. And third page, one, two. Okay, that's all. Thank you so much, everyone. And also thank you so much, Tanajan Yudatamo, once again. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you. Bye -bye. Sato, Sato. Please never forget to register your name in the chat box that I sent the link. Okay, see you thank next you, time. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you very much.